reading a couple scripture verses for us. Let's, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. This is a, a, an Old Testament prophecy that described in profound accuracy the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, even his resurrection, that the Lord was, Isaiah was writing in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. And the Lord mentions, I'll, I'll start with verse 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Verse 11, this is where I want to get to. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. And that's going to be the theme of this message today is justification by faith. He will justify the many. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets foresaw the time when God would justify the many through the crucifixion of Messiah, Jesus Christ. He will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Now let's turn now to Romans chapter 4, verse 25, bringing this into the New Testament. Even as we celebrate today the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, Good Friday was the, was, the, was the entering into the experience of his death and his suffering, but today is the day when we celebrate the resurrection and what he accomplished for us on the cross through his resurrection. Verse 25, that he was delivered over because of our transgressions. He was delivered over to the cross for our transgressions. And this is what we celebrate today. He was raised. He was raised from the dead. Uh, the New American Standard says because of our justification, but I like just to say for our justification. It's what the King James Version translates. So I like the for better. But he was resurrected. He was raised from the dead for our justification. And that's what I want to talk about today is, the, is what it means to be justified by faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ happened to justify us by faith. What does it mean to be justified by faith? And the last message I preached a few weeks ago, I preached about living from victory. And I got a, a lot of feedback from people saying how much that message really helped them. And, you know, they were saying, I, I've, you know, I've never heard things like that before. And just the importance of what it means to be justified by faith. And I just thought, okay... Ba on this day, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is a real profound need for the body of Christ to go deeper into what it means to be justified by faith. Now, why is this so important? Why is this so important? Is I just, I, I've been, I'm, I'm in a lot of, I'm in research mode because I'm beginning to write another book, probably two books that are right now. And I'm in research mode, just really researching and studying about salvation and what it means and what different people believe about it. And I've just become more and more aware of how, you know, this is a found, justification by faith is a foundational truth. And yet, much of the body of Christ, a good portion of the body of Christ does not understand it, even very solid teachers that, that I listen to, I just, you know, just... You know, just like, uh, for example, even like, uh, just listen to this YouTube teacher, and I, I love him. He's a great teacher. But he was, t he was talking about the parable of the foolish and the wise virgins, and that if we don't, you know, and I, I believe like he, he did, that if we, that this is the parable of the ten Christians, and that, that if he was saying if we don't get oil, if we don't, if we're not properly prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ, and we're, then we will, as a Christian, we'll lose our salvation and spend eternity in hell. And I, saw, I heard that, and I was like, wow, that, that, is, that is a direct contradiction to justification by faith. This is an excellent teacher. And he even went on to say that, that you will not know if you're truly saved until you have your glorified body. And I was like, wow, okay. I mean, this is serious that, that the body of Christ does not really understand justification by faith. I mean, we, come, we came out of the Reformation, and, 
You know, some people have coined the phrase, the five solas, which is we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, by, as revealed in Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. But I believe that, that some of us have actually drifted from that core, that core teaching of justification by faith. And, and it's so important that we understand the foundations of the gospel. In fact, Angie had a dream after I preached that message, Living from Victory. I won't go into the details, but the gist of the dream was there is a real need and a real hunger in the body of Christ for the foundational truths of the gospel. And, and this, is, this, kind of, this is where I'm coming from uh, in this message that, that we need to really, really be grounded ourselves in what it means to be justified by faith. Even someone like John Piper, I don't know if you, probably most of you know John Piper. I, I highly respect John Piper. I've been influenced by John Piper greatly, but even John Piper teaches a, what he calls a final salvation, which is two, two justifications by faith, two justifications, one by faith and a final justification by works. And I'm like, you know, even someone as solid as John Piper this is what he said. He said, in final salvation at the last judgment, faith is confirmed by the sanctifying fruit it is born. Listen to this. And we are saved through that fruit. In other words, the fruit that, we, that God produces in us, we're saved by that fruit. That means we're saved by obedience and we're saved by faith. I don't really know how you can get around looking at this and saying that's, that's teaching salvation by works. My point is that we really must be grounded in what it means to be justified by faith because, because Jesus Christ and his teachings and James and his teachings did not contradict Paul in Romans chapter 3 and through 5. They did not contradict the book of Galatians, which is clearly justification by faith. And so what I want to do as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ today, I want us to really take a deep, deep dive into what it means to be justified by faith. And you know, here's a couple reasons why, why this is important. Is a couple reasons, I'll just list a few reasons why this is important is this is important because a lot of believers live as if salvation from eternal damnation and hell is by faith plus works. And I want to just shatter that belief because there is nothing we could ever do to be righteous enough to stand before a holy God. We must have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ and to be declared righteous or we will spend eternity in hell. The, the, the second thing I'm seeing is that there is a, a, a growing number of believers, sincere, true believers, that are either trying to prove that they are saved by their obedience to demonstrate, I am saved and I'm showing you by my obedience, or they are trying to stay saved by their obedience. And both are deadly. Both are dangerous. In fact, Paul was warning the Galatians and saying, if you're seeking to be justified by works, then you are severed from Christ, you have fallen from grace, and you are actually under the curse of the law. This is, this is a big deal. This is a big deal that we get this right. I'm also seeing that many people, many believers, are misinterpreting passages of Scripture. And as I said, I'm doing this deep, deep, deep study that, that basically they're, they're basically saying that, that Jesus and some of the things he said contradicted what Paul said in Romans 3 through 5 and what he said in Galatians, the book of Galatians. And, and so we've got to get this right. We've got to get what Paul taught in Romans 3 through 5. We've got to get this correct. We've got to understand what it means. That's the burden I'm carrying today as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if we don't get this foundational thing right, everything we build is going to be askewed. Everything we build is going to be crooked. It's, not, it's going to be built on the wrong foundation. Many, I, I think, are trying to be sanctified by... See, if you are not absolutely rock-solid confident that you're born again, and that you're justified, and the Spirit of God dwells in you, what you will do is you will try to obey through fear. If hell is hanging over, if, if you're just dangling over hell 
as if one wrong thing, you're going to, God's just going to drop you into the pit of hell. What you're going to do is you're going to live a life of obedience that's based in fear. I mean, how many of you have ever done that? I have, and it's a miserable way to live. It's a terrible way to live that you are not confident that you are justified by faith and by faith alone, by grace through faith alone. Not by what you do, but what, what, by what Christ has done. See, God, again, I say this all the time, fear-based obedience, performance-based obedience is better than disobedience, all right? But God wants to get us to this place where we're obeying because the affections of our heart have been transformed by his enabling grace. And we're not obeying based on the fear of hell. We're, obe we're obeying based on the fear of God. Because we love God and we want to serve him. We love God and our affections for the Lord are moving us to want to obey. Not because we're trying to obey so we won't go to hell. There's a very different way of obeying. Does that make sense? And like I said last, in my last message that many believers are obeying for righteousness they're obeying for approval. They're obeying for love. They're obeying for God to like them instead of being, obeying from God's approval, from God's righteousness, from God's salvation, from God's love. And that, that might sound, that's a small thing in words. That's huge. Are you obeying God for or are you obeying God from? That's huge. I, I spent a whole message talking about that. So... That's kind of where I'm coming from on this day when we celebrate the resurrection is I, I want to talk about in this message five characteristics of justification. But before I do that, I want to just lay out some key terms so we have some understanding of what, of what Scripture teaches about the difference between justification, sanctification, and glorification. Those are kind of some theological terms, but I'll just make it real simple. Justification means to be just as if you had never sinned. Justification means that God has declared you righteous even though you're not righteous, but you're, he has declared you righteous because you're in Christ. Sanctification means you are being made righteous in your actual character, in your mind, your will, and your emotions, in your heart. Sanctification means you are becoming pure, you're becoming holy, you're becoming conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And glorification takes place at the resurrection of the dead when God raises your body up from the grave and you reunites it with your redeemed soul and puts his glory onto you and to your resurrected body. And so there's, there, this is what Paul defined, this is where a lot of confusion comes in when we read the scriptures, is because Paul said, Paul defined salvation in three ways, in three tenses. Paul said, we have been saved. Paul said that we are being saved and that we will be saved. And they're not the same thing. That, so we, we come into the scriptures and everything, salvation, go to hell, or go to heaven when you die, go to heaven when you die, go to heaven when you die. Everything's read through that paradigm, so we can't see out of that. But Paul, the, the word salvation basically means deliverance. And so when you see saved or salvation in, in the New Testament, you've got to ask yourself, what is that context telling you you are being saved from? Everything, every time you see the word saved, it doesn't mean saved from hell. It might mean saved from sin, saved from the power of sin, saved from something like that. So you've got to look in the context. But when Paul says you have been saved, he's talking about justification. Justification, just as if you had never sinned. Justification, a declaration that God says you are righteous in Jesus Christ. This is from, this is building off the last, the message I did a couple weeks ago is this is when God imputes righteousness to you. And I shared about imputed does not mean you are actually righteous. It means God reckons it to your account and declares you are righteous even though you're not because of Jesus Christ. And when you are declared righteous through imputed righteousness, God then justifies you. You are born again. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're born again. The indwelling spirit comes to dwell in your human spirit, and he makes your spirit new, righteous, alive, resurrected, holy, and complete. Not your soul, not your body, but your spirit. That's what it means to be born again. And then you look at John 14, 20, that the Lord said, 
talking about, I think he's talking about what it means to be in Christ, but he says that in that day you will know that I am in you, you're born again, and you are in me. You're placed into Christ. See, when you're justified, when you're born again, you are placed into Christ. Therefore, whatever is true of Jesus Christ is now in God's eyes reckoned true to be, about you, to be true about you. That means you have died to sin. That means you were crucified when he was crucified. That means you are raised from the dead when he was raised from the dead. That means you now have new life. That means you are now in Christ, seated far above all powers and principalities, seated on the throne with Jesus Christ, far above everything. That's your legal position because of justification by faith. See, when, when Paul says you have been saved, this is related to your, uh, your, you being saved from the penalty of sin. Okay, so just d get this in your head right here. When Paul says you have been saved, you ask, saved from what? Saved from the penalty of sin. Justification saves you from the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? It's eternal damnation in hell. Trust me, you don't want to go to hell. Eternal damnation in hell. Justification saves you from eternal damnation in hell. It determines that you are going to heaven, that the penalty for sin has been paid, that you are now a child of the Father by new birth, that now you are betrothed to Jesus Christ as his bride. All in one act of faith, God does that. It's a beautiful. We need to never depart from that. All of this takes place by a gift of God's grace alone through faith. Revelation 21, verse 6 says, Come to the living water, or, or whoever is thirsty, or I'm botching it, but it says, uh, Come and drink without cost from the living water. The, the gift of salvation is free. It costs you nothing. It costs Jesus everything, but it costs you nothing. Now, discipleship costs you everything, but discipleship comes after justification. Discipleship costs you everything, but salvation costs you nothing. It's free. It is a free gift of God's unmerited grace. You cannot earn it. You can't deserve it. It is by grace through faith when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as you believe, as you surrender, and as you receive God's unmerited gift of grace. This new... See, when, when you are born again and God says you are justified... It's as if you, God says to you, just as if you had never sinned. You get a new righteous status before God that gives you the freedom and the escape from the penalty of sin, the penalty of, of sin, which is hell. It's a beautiful God. It's, it's, thank God. Thank God. Now, that's not sanctification. Sanctification is vastly different. Justification declares you are righteous, even though you're not. Sanctification is the lifelong process of making you actually righteous and conforming you into the image of Jesus Christ. And so when Paul said you are being saved, he was basically meaning you are in this process of sanctification. Now, if you're in Christ and you're in this process of sanctification... If you were to die before that process of sanctification was complete, you would, you would go to heaven because of justification. I heard the story that I haven't confirmed. This just came to my mind. I haven't actually fact-checked it, so I saw it on the Internet, so take it for what it's worth. I think it's true. But when they were constructing the Golden Gate Bridge, that they had this problem where all these people were working on the Golden Gate Bridge, but they were so terrified of falling in you know, as they're building the Golden Gate Bridge, there was no safety net, and they were so terrified that during construction they would just so carefully, you know, ner as I would be, I hate heights, uh, I would never be a worker on the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> but they had no safety net, and so what happened is they, their, their construction, their progress was going so slow, and they said, okay, this is going to take us forever. And they said, okay, we're going to build a safety net under 
underneath the construction of this bridge so that if anyone falls during the construction, that they're not going to fall to their death. They're going to fall into the safety net. And what they found is the progress sped up uh, tremendously because you weren't trying to obey out of this fear of dying. And that's really what justification does as it relates to sanctification is you are, you are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you can't walk away from him. You can. That doesn't mean you can't apostatize from him. You can. But no one can snatch you out of his hand. You can walk away, but no one can snatch you out of his hand. That gives you security in the process of sanctification. That as you are being saved... See, this means that the salvation, this is what we've been talking about in the indwelling life class for, for however many months now, is the salvation that God worked into your human spirit when you were born again. Sanctification is the working out of that salvation that was imparted into your human spirit when God saved you. The working out of that salvation with fear and trembling, that is sanctification. That is a process that is a partnership between both God who is at work in you and your obedience with God. See, where salvation, whereas justification is completely of God and nothing of you, you just believe that Jesus died for your sins and you're saved, sanctification absolutely requires your participation and your work. Sanctification requires that you obey. Sanctification requires you take up your cross. Sanctification requires that you strive to enter into the narrow gate. Sanctification requires that you, that, like Paul said, I run this race, I discipline my body, I make it my slave so that I would not be disqualified. He wasn't being worried about being disqualified from going to heaven. He was worried about being disqualified from winning the eternal rewards that God was offering him. So there is a safety net as you are being sanctified. Thank God that if you make mistakes and if you mess up, you're not going to fall all the way down to your death in hell. Thank God. It's the worst thing in the world if you're trying to live a holy life in this fear of going to hell for one wrong mistake. Justification gives you that safety net on the process of being sanctified. See, sanctification is synonymous with what both Jesus, Peter, and James said is the salvation of your soul. See, your spirit was saved in a moment by God's transforming work of grace when you were born again. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Your spirit was regenerated. Your spirit was made new and righteous and holy and complete. But your soul was not. And so sanctification is the salvation of your soul, the deliverance from not the penalty of sin, deliverance from the power of sin. That sin that is at work in your soul, that sin that is at work in your body that causes you to sin, that causes you to do things that don't please God, that causes you to be selfish, Sanctification is being delivered from the power of sin. And as you know, if you've ever been on this, if you're on this road to sanctification, that takes a lifetime. That is not in an instant. That, that and it's often painful. It's often through trials that you are being saved in your soul. That's often through dark nights of the soul, wilderness wanderings, is often through trials and tribulations and baptisms by fire that you are being sanctified. But as you're being sanctified, you're not at risk of falling down to your death because justification is your salvation from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is your salvation from the power of sin that is at work in your human body and in your soul. See, being saved does not determine your eternal des destination. Justification determines your eternal destination. Being saved determines your eternal destiny. Vastly different. Vastly, vastly different. Many believers think everyone's destiny in heaven is going to be the same. Absolutely not. You couldn't be further from the truth. 
Sanctification determines your eternal destiny and the eternal rewards you receive at the judgment seat of Christ. Sanctification determines whether, uh, whether you will have what I call, or what Dad has called as well, eternal intimacy with Jesus Christ, eternal authority to rule and reign with him, and eternal glory. See, every believer is not going to be married to Jesus Christ. It's determined by your sanctification. The bride makes herself ready. That's, the bride isn't making herself ready or she goes to hell. No, the bride is making herself ready to be married to him. That's sanctification. See, uh, sanctification is this process that is both a partnership between the Spirit of God in you and your your own uh, heart and soul cooper and body cooperating with the grace of God, grace-empowered obedience to be made ready. There is a vast difference between, you know, Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount is those who obey the commandments of God and teach others to do the same will be called great in the kingdom of God. And he said, those who disobey the commandments of God and teach others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of God. See, sanctification determines whether or not you rule and reign with him. It doesn't determine where you spend eternity. It determines your eternal destiny, not your eternal destination. And so, you know, Paul also talked about at the resurrection of the dead, there is one glory of the sun, one glory of the moon, and one, another glory of the faint star. And the depth of your sanctification determines the intensity of your glorification. That's why how we live is so vital. So vital how we live. In the fear of God, if you care about your eternal destiny, It's not the same for every Christian. It's not Christian socialism where everyone gets the same reward. Absolutely not. Sanctification determines the way you live, the holiness that God works in you and you respond to, determines forever whether or not you rule and reign with him whether or not you're made ready as his bride, whether or not you become, you mature from that child by new birth into that mature son who is able to be placed into the the son of God's messianic inheritance. That's sanctification. See, justification saves you from the penalty of sin. Sanctification saves you from the power of sin. And then the last one is glorification. You will be saved. This relates to the redemption of your body when at the second coming of Jesus Christ, there's actually two resurrections. There's a resurrection when Jesus comes back, when he returns to the earth. That's called the first resurrection. I don't believe personally every believer will experience that. That's a whole other subject. But there's another resurrection that comes a thousand years later that will be the resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. But the point is, is your soul, a lot of you are like scratching your head, what does he mean by that? Okay, I'm not going to even go there, it's way too complicated. Okay, so back to this. Is glorification, you will be saved, that relates to your soul and your body being reunited at the resurrection. Just a side note, I don't recommend cremation. That's not, has nothing to do with this message, but if, but if you're thinking about cremation, I would not, have, I would not do that because... I don't know how that works. I guess God is, you know, you seek the Lord about that. I don't know why, where I'm even saying that. <laughs> but if any one of you are thinking about cremation, I would think twice about that personally because, I don't know, they, in the New Old Testament, they, they, they sought for a better resurrection. Um, I mean, I guess God can take ashes and put it back to, I'm sure he can. But anyway, anyway, that's, that's not, nothing to do with my message. Happy uh, Resurrection Sunday. Glor- glorification is we will be saved. Glorification equips you for your destiny based on the eternal rewards you receive at the judgment seat of Christ. This is what I want you to hear this. Glorification, resurrection, saves you from the pollution of sin that is at work in your human body. Okay, so we have justification. It saves you from the penalty of sin, which is hell. Sanctification saves you from the power of sin, which is presently at work in your body. Glorification saves you 
from the pollution of sin that is inherent in your body. That when we get that new, resurrected, glorified body, we are not going to have that sin nature that we currently have. Praise God for that. Okay. That's the difference between glorification, sanctification, and justification. So now, let me talk, let me talk about um, five characteristics here about justification that we want to just really, really get into our hearts at a deep, deep, deep level. Is number one, justification is not based upon obedience to God's commandments. Many are getting this wrong in the church. But Paul was very clear about this. Let's look at this in Romans chapter 3. You, you could also look in Galatians to see the same thing. But Romans chapter 3, verse 20, is in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Paul is talking. And, and by the way, the book of Romans is like the, if you want to know what the gospel is about, the book of Romans is, is what this gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. I love the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3 is Paul is writing and he says, by the works of the law. Okay, what does he mean by works of the law? He means everything that is required to obey God's commandments. That's what he means. Because by all that's involved to obey God's commandments, no flesh will be justified in his sight. It does, Paul's saying, I don't care if you obey God's commandments like the most strict Pharisee. You can never be justified by that. Now, some people go, well, he's talking about the ceremonial commandments or the dietary commandments or the civil commandments in the Old Testament law. But look at what he says in that same verse. He says, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. He's talking about the moral commandments. The Ten Commandments. He's talking about idolatry and adultery and murder and uh, coveting and things like that. He's talking about the moral commandments. What Paul is basically saying is no amount of commandment keeping. And I would say even in the New, even New Testament commandments would also apply. No amount of commandment keeping can ever make you righteous in God's eyes. Because James says... If you break one commandment of the law, you're guilty of all of those commandments. I think there's like 613 commandments in the law. If you break one of those, okay, he says this in, I think it's James chapter 2. Don't commit adultery. Okay, we don't do that. But do you commit murder? You know, hopefully no one here does. But uh, do you covet? If you've, if you've done if you've broken one of those commandments, James says you're guilty of the entire law. In other words, you can never be righteous by commandment keeping, by obedience. Well, if you think, okay, well, you got the self-righteousness about you, oh, I can do it, I, 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 trust me, I'm obedient. Jesus would call you out in the Sermon on the Mount and says, the Pharisees had external righteousness. They had external compliance with do not murder and do not commit adultery. But I say to you, it goes from the externals down into your heart. That if you even look at a woman to lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. That if you even have hate in your heart towards your brother, you've committed murder. In other words, it is impossible to ever be justified in God's sight by commandment keeping. Now, obedience is vital. Don't get me, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Obedience is vital, but you can never be put into a right position in, in, in God's eyes by your obedience. Because you, if you fail in one place, then you failed entirely. See, bringing it down to the New Testament. Bring, bring it down to the New Testament is no amount of obedience. Fasting once a week. Now, fasting is important, but it does not give you a right standing with God. Praying, praying every day, reading the Bible, tithing, you know, obeying the commandments, showing compassion. None of those things can give you a righteous status before God. None of those things can. Now, all of those things are very important. 
But those relate to sanctification, not justification. See, saint justification, you can never be placed into a righteous status before God where he says you are righteous in Christ by your obedience to God's commandments. Number two is justification is by grace alone through faith alone. I just want us to just get this in our heart. You cannot achieve justification. You can only receive justification. See, the law condemns the, the best of us while grace saves the worst of us. You can never be justified by anything you do. It's all by what Jesus Christ has done. When he said on the cross in John 19, 20, or 1930, when he said on the cross, it is finished. Those three words were the most important words in human history, on the most important event in human history, that it is finished. The debt has been paid in full. The righteousness by that one act of obedience, that righteousness of Jesus Christ, as he obeyed the Father perfectly, as he obeyed the law perfectly, is now imputed to you by faith. Not but before you do anything for God. That righteousness is imputed to you by faith and faith alone, by grace and grace alone. It is not by your works. It is a free gift of God's grace. It cannot be merited or earned. It's free. It's a gift that can only be received, not achieved. It is a gift of God to you to receive that gift of grace that is free, unearned, unmerited. It's by grace through faith. It is not by works. It is not by obedience. It is not by good behavior. It is by grace through faith. Amen. All right. Number three. Justification breaks the power of sin. I saw this survey on Twitter this week. And in the survey, again, I didn't fact check it, but I trust the guy who said it. As a pastor, James Emery White said that I once read that a survey of psychologists, they revealed that the, they, they, revealed that they felt that 70% of their patients would be healed if they could just get rid of their guilt. I believe it. I believe that's true. I didn't fact check it, but I know the power of guilt. I believe that the deepest root of slavery to sin is the feeling that we can never be forgiven or made righteous. Stronger than the allurement of future sin is the bondage of past sin. Yes. <laughs> if you've ever been in the past, if you have a past, I have a past, you understand that the guilt from the past can keep you in bondage to that sin even stronger than the allurement of the future sin. And that when God justifies you and he says, just as if you had never sinned because the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you and he declares you, you are righteous in my sight. It breaks the power of guilt, shame, and condemnation because there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. See, some people, and even Paul wrestled with this. He's like, well, are you saying that we should sin so that grace may increase? And, and Paul's like, God forbid. Don't you know that you died with Jesus Christ? How could you still live in it? See, if you're hearing from this message, a license to sin, there's nothing wrong with my message. There's something as badly wrong with you. It's called your flesh and your selfishness. This is God's free grace. And if you're hearing it at a license to sin, it reveals the depravity of your sin nature. And there's nothing wrong with God in this. It should hopefully lead us to want to live in a, a life of obedience, which is what Romans 6 and Romans 7 and Romans 8 is all about. That you would be slaves of obedience. That's sanctification. That you would commit yourself to being slaves of obedience. 
But I just want to just linger here for just a bit is that justification breaks the power of sin because justification declares you no matter what you have done and no matter what has been done to you, the Lord says because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you are declared righteous. You are declared righteous. That breaks the power of sin, which is guilt, shame, and condemnation that keeps you on this going around in circles and circles around in the wilderness for 40 years because, you're, you're, we, because we're being tormented by the past without realizing justification sets you free from that sin. Those sins. See, when we feel unforgivable, when we feel unrighteous, when we feel unworthy because of what we did in the past, we are held captive by sin's greatest weapons of guilt, shame, and condemnation. In this condition, despair, hopelessness, despondency rule our lives. Guilt drives us. Condemnation weighs on us, and shame defines who we are. See, Paul said the power of sin is the law. Because even though the law, even though God's commandments are holy, righteous, and just, and God's commandments define sin, point out sin, God's commandments actually cause sin to increase, giving sin greater and greater power. Because Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I didn't even know... I didn't know it was a sin to covet like I'm coveting until the law said, you shall not covet. The power of the command, the, the power of sin is in the law. And if we don't experience that inward imputed righteousness where God says you are righteous in Jesus Christ, the guilt, the shame, and the condemnation from the past can keep you in bondage greater than the allurement of future sin. Now let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 7. Romans 6, verse 7. Or actually, let's start with verse 6. As Paul said, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with. That actually means in order that our body of sin would be rendered powerless. That's what it means. When you were crucified with Jesus Christ because you experienced a resurrection in your human spirit, the body of sin was rendered powerless now because there is a greater power in you called Jesus Christ in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the indwelling Holy Spirit. He is now greater than the power of sin at work in your body. And he says, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Now notice verse 7. For he who has died is freed from sin. That word freed is actually the word justification. What Paul is, I don't think it's a bad translation in my opinion in the New American Standard. I think it should be called translated justification. Is that we would no longer be slaves to sin. What Paul's logic is, is you can be set, full of, you, you can be set free from slavery to sin because when Christ died, you died. And when you died in Christ, you were justified just as if you had never sinned. The bondage to sin can be broken. When you hear God say to you, my beloved, you are not a hopeless hypocrite wandering around in sin, shame, and condemnation. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Having that declaration of righteousness declared over you and experiencing that, not just knowing the doctrine, but experiencing God himself by the Spirit penetrating into that guilt, that shame, and that condemnation, and you experience for the first time, I am am the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It breaks the slavery to sin. 
because it deals with that fundamental root problem of guilt for my sin. Your sins have been paid. Your sins have been paid in full. We've got to get this right, that in Christ, we are forgiven and declared righteous before one act of obedience. If we try to begin obeying God, again, always hear me, bad, bad obedience is better than disobedience. So if you're still getting, trying to obey God out of guilt, shame, and condemnation, that's better than disobedience. But God wants us to get into this grace-empowered, affection-filled obedience that we obey Jesus because we love him. Not to prove we love him, but because we love him. Because grace is working in our hearts and we want to be fully obedient because we learn love, not because we're trying to get some guilt taken off of us. See, we are forgiven and declared righteous before one act of obedience and this legal foundation of justification becomes the beachhead where we wage war against sin's allurement. See, we fight, we fight, we fight sin from this foundational place of justification. We fight the selfishness that we all have from this foundational place that God says in Jesus Christ you are declared righteous before one act of obedience. And if you make mistakes, you're not like unjustified. You're justified. Push delete. Run to God and receive his forgiveness. I mean, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Number four. Is justification precedes sanctification. When Paul was teaching in Romans, Romans 3, Romans 4, Romans 5, simple math, came before Romans 6, Romans 7, and Romans 8. Romans 3 through 5 is all about justification. Romans 6 through 8 is all about sanctification. Justification precedes sanctification. Being declared righteous comes before being made righteous. And the depth to, I'm convinced of this, the depth to which you experience justification determines how deep your sanctification is going to be. Those who have been forgiven much love much. And so justification precedes Sanctification. See, I sometimes hear, I just you know, I read read a lot, and listen to a lot of people, different, just seeing what people are teaching and stuff like that. I hear this statement a lot in the body of Christ, and I think it's absolutely false. True Christians are disciples, and if you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you're not a true Christian. Okay, how many people have heard that? You don't have to raise your hand, but I'm, yeah. It's a very popular statement, and I probably have said it as well myself. True Christians are disciples, and if you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you're not a true Christian. That would be an absolute contradiction to what Paul taught in Romans 3 through 5. Discipleship follows justification. It's not a condition for justification. I hear this a lot. True Christians obey God's commandments, and if you're not obeying God's commandment, then you're not a true Christian. I would say, well, if you have never, if there's never been any type of fruit, you're probably not saved. But obedience, it might take years for obedience to come. How do we know whether who's a true Christian or not? God knows. My point is, Justification comes before sanctification. And if we try to obey before we are justified, then it's not going to have... If we try to obey God before we're justified, then we're going to try to be accepted by God by what we do instead of obeying Him from the fact that He declares us righteous. Does that make sense? Therefore... 
See, when, when Jesus talked about discipleship, he said, no, dis discipleship is critical. <laughs> don't get me wrong. People will be like, you don't believe in discipleship? <laughs> it's everything. And discipleship is everything. But discipleship, think about this. The Lord said, unless you hate your father and your mother and your brother and your sister and your wife and even your own life, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. That would be obedience that would contradict what Paul is saying. My point is this, is discipleship comes out of justification. Is that once God says, and I could prove this also in some other ways, but I won't right now. Justification, when God says you are declared righteous, then we start on the painful, costly road of discipleship. Then we start on denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following him. Then we get into that place of first love, where we love Jesus more than we love anyone and anyone else, anyone and everyone else. It comes after just sanctification, holiness, purity comes out of justification and not the other way around. If we get it mixed up, we're going we're gonna to be in some trouble. This means then that being made ready, we know our, our mandate as a, as a church is to make the bride of Jesus Christ ready. Being made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ comes out of justification. In fact, you can read in, in Revelation 19, 7 through 8, is, it says that it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, uh, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That word righteous acts in the Greek means what you do from the initial declaration of righteousness. What you do from justification is the wedding dress you wear for all eternity. How you respond to Jesus, to the Father saying over you, you are righteous in Christ. How you respond and how you live your life is the wedding dress you will wear for all eternity. If you do nothing, you will spiritually be naked in heaven. That's why, you know, the Lord said, that the shame of your neck, that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. How shameful it would be to stand before the Lord with such an incredible gift of righteousness and justification, and not to have done anything with that gift, and not to have a wedding dress made for our bridegroom. It would be the ultimate act of shame. Now, you would feel shame at the judgment seat of Christ, I assure you. <laughs> See, the key to overcoming lust, anger, pride, envy, addictions, or any other besetting sin is to know deep in your heart you have received the gift of imputed righteousness, and the judge of heaven has declared you legally righteous before the Supreme Court of heaven. Overcoming sin comes from the, the, the reality that God says before one act of obedience you are declared righteous in Jesus Christ. Number five. Let me read Romans chapter five, verse nine. Let me just read actually verse one. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you, you have peace with God through Jesus Christ by faith. Now notice what he says in verse 2. Through whom also we have obtained or we have access to our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Justif and you know this, but justification is only, only, only the very beginning. But what I'm trying to get into our hearts is that if we don't have the right foundation from the beginning, our sanctification will be off. And that we need to come back to the right foundation to be made ready, that we're made ready because God declares over us, 
You are declared righteous in Jesus Christ. Now let's look at uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 9. And this, I think I forgot to mention, point five is justification is the only way to escape God's eternal wrath in hell. Romans 5, verse 9. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Thank God. You do not want to go to hell. I read this, listened to a testimony and read this book by this man who, who had a near-death experience and, and God miraculously saved him. But he, I don't know how long he was in hell for, but it was absolutely, it, it was almost unbearable to read. It was so terrible. Just the torture that this man saw and experienced himself, just unbearable, just terrible, awful. Just I forget his name. Brian starts with an M, but I, it, it's just uh, an just an, an inc- I would highly. Well, I guess you can't really look it up if you don't know his last name. I'll try to find it for you. But just his testimony of what hell was like was, I mean, almost like I couldn't even read it. It was so. So terrible, the torture that was taking place. God's, the only way to escape the penalty for sin is by being justified in Jesus Christ. I don't care if you from this, from this point on have the most holy, perfect life in your own eyes, it could still never measure up to the holiness of God's presence. You must have justification or you will not go to heaven when you die. That's why the, this idea that, that okay, you, you get justified in Jesus Christ and then you must maintain that justification by obedience is total nonsense. Your obedience, now again, again, people could walk away thinking, I don't think obedience or discipleship is important. Farthest from the truth. I'm just trying to get our foundation correct. If if you think your obedience and your sanctification could ever make you righteous and holy enough to stand before a holy God, you're absolutely deceived. I don't care if you obey every single commandment from the depths of your heart. There's still that perfection that God requires to enter into heaven and to his holiness of his presence. You must have the gift of imputed righteousness given to you. You must be declared righteous in Jesus Christ. It is the only way we can escape the penalty of sin is by faith in Jesus Christ and receiving the gift of righteousness that comes through faith in him. It's the only way. See, even though discipleship, radical obedience, sanctification, and works don't determine our eternal destination, where we're going to spend eternity, these absolutely do determine how we will spend eternity. Okay? But justification, the penalty of sin being paid for, determines where we'll spend eternity, not sanctification. See, the eternal rewards of eternal intimacy, eternal authority, and eternal glory are determined by our commitment and faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Our obedience and sanctification, us taking up the cross, the works we do determine our status in the kingdom of God and whether we will rule and reign with him. But it doesn't determine whether or not we'll be in the kingdom of God. That's justification. And so just as we close this message, just want to just say, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, as we celebrate today his resurrection, as we celebrate his crucifixion, his burial, his death, and his resurrection, I just want to invite you, and I know we probably, most people here are saved, but if you've never truly put your faith in Jesus Christ, 
Just, just, just for a second, just close, everyone close their eyes. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ and in his finished work, if you're not born again and you want to, you want to be saved, just want to ask you to raise your hand. Amen. Let me close. We're going to take communion here in a second, but let me close this message. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for the free gift of salvation. It is without cost. It is without cost to drink from the living water without cost. Justification is a free gift of God's grace by faith. Lord, I'm praying for all of us, Lord, who are truly born again. Father, I'm praying for all of us that we would get ready and we would be enter into sanctification from this essential foundation. Lord, I just pray that there would be a revelation in our hearts, Lord, where we are trying to get ready for your approval instead of from your approval. We were, tr we were trying to get sanctified from or for righteousness instead of working from righteousness. Lord, would you just bring about any correction to get on that right foundation in Jesus Christ, or that we might be sanctified from that right place, that right foundation. And Lord, I pray, Father, for anyone that would struggle from their past, that would struggle with guilt and shame and condemnation, who are continually spinning around in circles, spiraling because of something they did in the past, that they would experience today, Lord, I pray, the depth of justification that God himself says to you, my beloved, you are righteous in Jesus Christ, not by what you do, but because of what my son has done. Let us experience that, Lord, in a, in a much greater, much deeper way, we pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to end the online portion, and we're going to take communion. Um, could we have the worship?